2 grams and there are five species of scorpions in the New Valley region among 31 species all over Egypt and um, 2000 or rather from 2000 to 2500 around the world. To the vaccine, several healthcare staff at a hospital in Sungai Bulo, Malaysia, were given doses of a coronavirus vaccine as the country carries on on a national virus immunization drive. Now, Malaysia received its first batch of doses in late February. The process was very simple, it was very fast and efficient and the vaccine is not painful at all. So I'm feeling very happy and very excited and safe right now. Despite having the vaccine, we still have to monitor ourselves. Our masks should be there, our SOPs must be followed, hand washing, social distancing is still a must. And uh, to our conversation of the day, or at least something that points us to the same, it's time for women to take charge of their lives and be more intentional about what they want. According to Scanem Interlabel's Head of Planning, Customer Service and Procurement, Juliet Karanja, who is a woman in manufacturing, passion is what drives one to achieve their goals. She spoke to our roving reporter, Brian Mushiri, on life as a woman in manufacturing in this edition of your voice this morning on your world it's all about women and on your voice I'm here at Scanem Interlabels to speak to Juliet Karanja she's the head of planning customer service and procurement here at Scanem Interlabels in fact here she is hey Mambo. Oko Sambamba. I think we can walk in okay sure thing Hi, morning. Good morning. How are you? Very well. How are you? Very Thank you. We are called label converters. So what we do is that we do product labels. We print the labels that you see on your normal products, personal care, home care, um, food items. So we do the printing of those particular labels. Printing falls under very many categories, but what we do specifically at Scanem is we use flexo uh, presses. Flexo presses basically use what we call plates, which are made of um, some sort of rubber. So these plates are loaded onto cylinders, and these are the ones that, use to, uh, that are used to make the imprints on the different types of paper. And just to give you an insight, there are very many different types of papers. If you think about the different products in the markets, um, lubricants, your personal care, home care, all those labels may look the same, but in actual sense how they are constructed, the word we use is constructed, how these papers are constructed are all different. Even what you see on your yogurt labels that, that looks like a cup, it's actually a label that is printed and we actually do that here. We call it an in-mold label. We print up to 10 colors. So there's full colour. The fortunate thing about uh, working for a company such as Canem is that there is inclusivity. So that made it easier into the journey into manufacturing. When you have an employer who thinks about inclusivity uh, regardless of um, your gender, it's all about what you know, so it makes it easier. Yes, I have interacted with uh, males, uh, in the industry, but yes, there's always that shock of you're in manufacturing. How are you in manufacturing? Uh, but then again, as I said, the thing that gives you an edge is if you know what you're doing. So automatically, if you do, there, there comes about some sort of respect because you're not just second guessing yourself. Women in Manufacturing is a caucus under Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and it was a program that was introduced by KAM to provide an enabling platform for women-owned, um, women-funded or women-led um, organizations in manufacturing to be specific. So what they do is that they provide uh, a networking as well as learning experiences for women. Uh, they target SMEs to be specific, but even as an individual. And from here we get to interact with a lot of um, talented ladies. You're able to pick a lot of learnings 
and also quite encouraging when you get to see women ahead of you of something probably you are too, you are a bit skeptical about. All right. I am a mother of a five-year-old. He's called Jabari. Work-life balance is very important to me. So by the time uh, I'm looking at how my career path is going to grow, I looked at how possible is it to always have work-life balance. The importance of having an employer who supports both um, gender-based roles as well as work-life balance. So with that, I'm able to carry out my responsibilities at Scanem, um, with which are KPI targeted, and still have time to actually go home, be a mother, and enjoy exactly what I do. My biggest advice would be go for what you have passion in. Go for what you enjoy doing. Because if you enjoy doing something, even when a hurdle comes your way, you'll be able to tackle it because you enjoy it. The difference with going with something that you enjoy doing and something maybe you're just doing for the sake of doing is that you're able to come up with ways of tackling a challenge because you want to get back to the good side of what you're actually doing. So I would advise young women, if you are into manufacturing or any other STEM, STEM related um, industry, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, go for it, go for it. There's nothing stopping you. Um, in most cases, I think my biggest and the mantra that I believe in the most is that if a table has not been created for you, please take a moment, create your own table, create your own space, get in there, try what you want to try and never give up. Always have mentors and coaches. That is something that has helped me myself. Somebody who you can always walk up to and say, hey, I don't understand this part. Please guide me or please show me or please walk me through it. My name is Juliet Karanja. I am a woman in manufacturing and a happy Women's Day to all and everyone. And we celebrate you, Juliet Karanja, on this International Women's Day. And definitely, as I say, today is Christmas for women all over the world. And today, I would like to just celebrate them and also take a look at the strides we've made as women and also some of the realities that have come out of this pandemic for the women folk. And to help us do so, in studio, we have Jacqueline Mugo, who is the Executive Director of the Federation of Kenya Employers. We are also joined in the other studio by Ilado Galgalo, who is a security solutions architect, engineer, and of course, a women in technology champion at Safaricom. Also joined by Linda Kruger, who is a lead Dreams Innovation Challenge Project at Kellin. Also joined virtually by Beatrice Namunyak Lempaira, who is the Bidworks Production Manager at the Northern Rangeland Trust Trading. And also joined by Caroline Dongo, who is a marketing and corporate relations director at ABSA Kenya. Thank you all for joining us this morning and uh, I'll start off with you Jacqueline. Where you sit is what we see through the years and I think the past months that has been greatly challenged. The workplace, the employer-employee relationship because we had to adopt new ways of working. This morning what stands out for you? First, since I'm in the studio, let me wish all the women in Kenya and indeed in the world a very happy International Women's Day. Mm -hmm. What stands out for me um, from what happened in the last one year is really the resilient spirit of Kenyans mm -hmm. and people in the world. Because we were faced by a pandemic that nobody was ready for and we had to very quickly adjust to that. Mm -hmm. And when I see the steps that have been made by both corporates and workers and indeed everybody living in Kenya and in the world, that spirit of fighting another day, holding on to where you are, making sure that somehow you find a way of working and keeping your job. Mm. Many people lost their jobs, which is uh, very sad, and we are still struggling as an economy. So the coming together of Kenyans to face the situation and the challenge that we faced as COVID-19 was a, a great testimony to me of our commitment as a nation, but then there are also very many challenges mm -hmm. that emerged. And if I look at the workplace today, really the challenge is how are we going to create jobs, especially for women who are largely in the middle cadre? How are, they going, are we going to help them access power, economic power, power to education, because they've been excluded from this. They don't have access to health. 
if you look at all fields, despite the strides that have been made globally, the woman is still very much in the middle to lower cadre. Mm. So that resilient spirit, particularly of the women folk to me, is a great testimony to the fact that women can make a great difference and are already making a very great difference but given an opportunity we can do a lot more than that. Uh -huh. And definitely I love the fact that you touched on the economic empowerment that was actually highly affected in this pandemic. Let me bring in uh, Caroline Dongo. Definitely on a daily you meet and you cater for women that are there to get services from your bank to you know enable their businesses but the pandemic came and hit them hard. What stands out for you on a daily like this especially for the women thank you so much Gladys and uh, let me first wish everybody a happy International Women's Day you all look lovely ladies uh, so yeah um, I think uh, to answer your question Gladys uh, you know the pandemic hit and it hit hard it hit everyone hard but I think we all know that women were adversely affected and and I love what uh, Jacqueline has said about the the resilient spirit that was demonstrated by by women as they went through you know trying to keep their businesses going trying to keep their families going trying to keep themselves going themselves going so I think that was uh, you know and allow me just to plug here is what we call Africanacity the ingenious way in which uh, we get things done, and particularly uh, uh, women in this case, and the women, you know, the women in Kenya. So while um, you know we were thrown many curveballs, uh, I think what we did and what stood out for me is the way we reimagined ourselves, the way people changed tact. You know, so if you went a particular line of business, you found a different thing to do in order to uh, make ends meet, in order to keep yourself afloat. Um, you know, we we had to cope, we had to become teachers while we're in the household, at the same time still working from home for those of us who were in the corporate world. And that again also was something that was quite, uh, um, you know, uh, impressive from a, from a female perspective. We had to carry, we have to carry the community, you know, women are the, you know, we are empathetic and this is not a stereotype, it is actually just what it is that's innate in us, our empathetic nature. So carrying people along at, uh, sometimes at our own expense, uh, is something that we also, um, you know, uh, did quite a big job of, whether it was our families, our husbands, our children, the wider community. And I think for me that stood out, the ability to step outside of yourself, mm -hmm. uh, reimagine things, the woman, and um, support, support the wider community and find a way to get things done. Mm -hmm. Now the access to health is another that was hit hard because we had all these COVID-19 restrictions, protocols and access to health became quite a tricky place or something to access. And let me bring in Linda. This is where you come in because your project deals with health matters. What stood out for you? Um, thank you. Thank you, Gladys. I think beyond even the project and the large organization working on the right to health, we were able to monitor and highlight quite a number of health-related violations, especially when it came to vulnerable and marginalized populations. So we're talking about women bearing the biggest brunt of the pandemic when it came to accessing services, if you're talking about uh, maternal services, accessing medicine. We saw quite a number of stories within the media um, where women and young girls were not able to get the, um, the right health assistance that they needed because of the restrictions that we had. And then we also saw the early unintended pregnancies um, surge within the country. Uh, children were, were at home, there weren't really any clear parameters on what, to, what was going to happen next. So there was a really significant um, dent when it came to women's rights broadly but also in relation to women's health rights and also um, adolescent girls and young women. All right. And Beatrice, you join us from Samburu County and perhaps you resonate more about some of those obstacles that we're seeing during the pandemic. What stood out for you during this season, especially when it comes to women and girls? Uh, thank you, that is and for me is the, um, the fact that uh, we have this network of women uh, up in the north, not just um, uh, Samburu, Marsabit, Isiolo, Laikipia, mm -hmm. but women who've been able to come together and support each other. Whereas we've always been um, uh, doing businesses, it's the same network that has been able to support women to help each other go through, uh, go through the pandemic and also look at the issues that is affect, affecting them and their girls. 
one of the experiences that I had by uh, spending the time with the women is women being able to say that um, despite the girls uh, dropping out of school because of the long break and everything going on, they are here and they are willing to be able to take care of their daughters and their children for them to be able to go back to school. So it's the spirit of, uh, of the women up here, the women across the country and of course the world, who are willing to, to face these challenges and be able to find solutions that can help them go through the process. Beatrice, you. you are in charge of a number of conservancies that were and still are income honors for these women in these communities and these were also hit hard when there was no longer tourism you know and uh, to rely on so how was this received and how did you handle it uh to be honest just like the rest of the world uh we were really affected because uh bidworks basically sells 60 percent of our products abroad and um that meant the whole world was shut so how we coped is uh, we spent more time doing more trainings, but also just to uh, in initially we also think about this business holistically. So we are not just only thinking about bids. So we we worked with the women to be able to save part of their income in the savings and credit. And when things were really not working in terms of uh, the bids, the women were able to take loans from their circle and their savings to, sm uh, to start small businesses, which didn't necessarily look into the international world, but sell, you know, livestock and sell small shops and be able to cope. Uh -huh. Let me hear from Elado Galgalo. You come from, uh, is it Garisa or Marsabit? Marsabit, but you are a security solutions architect engineer with Safaricom. Now, this is a mainly male dominated field. And if there is a season, we have seen the importance of technology is this season. How has this been for you? Wow, thanks Gladys for hosting me here. First, I want to wish women out there happy International Women's Day. And yes, uh, uh, I'm from Safaricom, uh, leading uh, women in technology as a, one of the champions. Where women, women in technology Safaricom is a, a group of a passionate, ambitious individuals who come together and nature in, 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 in encourage young girls to STEM. And being one of the girls from Marsabit who has taken up the opportunity to take a male-dominated course, engineering, mm -hmm. to make a career. So we, we, we as Faricom went back to Marsabit to encourage young girls to technology, take up science and mathematics, which is a male-dominated uh, course, and then go to market, change the world. Okay, and how did that come to fusion during this season for you? Yeah. Uh, COVID has totally changed everything. It's not easy because we normally go to the, the outreach every region from 47 counties where I'm leading Marsabit as a county. I'm a champion there. But uh, since we cannot go physically on the ground as we used to go, but uh, with the use of technology, these days we are using some WhatsApp, some virtual training via Zoom. But it's not easy because it's it's better to be on ground, to be physically and you know, relate with these young girls, understand what they're going through. Okay, and we'll talk more about your field and what you've been able to achieve in a moment. So the International Women's Day 2021 theme is actually Women in Leadership Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. Jacqueline, when we think about the workplace, building an inclusive workplace for women to thrive, what does that entail and what have you seen the pandemic sort of illuminate the gaps within? They have there has been a lot of work done to create instruments to guide matters of inclusivity, encouraging diversity and women's access to work. The international labor conventions that talk about non-discrimination at work, the latest one was passed to deal with matters of violence and harassment at work, which has blocked a lot of women from progressing. So these instruments are there. We know our constitution envisages uh, gender balance and women having at least 30% uh, of the positions in public uh, offices. But really women are half, if not more, of the population. So what's envisaged is that 
half positions will be held by women and half by men. So workplaces have adopted many policies and they also um, adopt the national and the international instruments. So the legislation and the policy framework is there. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that at the workplace, women only represent 27% of the top level positions, that is board positions and executive positions. There are very many women at the middle to the lower cadres. Mm -hmm. Now, COVID-19 pandemic comes, and of course, those who are at the middle to the lower cadres are most uh, exposed and most vulnerable to, to job losses. And as a lot of us are saying, women also bear quite a heavy burden outside the workplace. There's a lot that you're doing at home. So the burden on, on women was very heavy. And what's happened is that we have had to push more for this inclusivity vision to be made a reality. How do you address issues of harassment and violence at the workplace? Because this, these are silent issues. How do you address the barriers to women's advancement? And so what we've done is come up with programs that help build the capacity and the competence of women to take up not just middle cadre positions, but senior level positions and top level positions. The Federation runs the Female Future Leadership Program, and I know there are a number of other programs that prepare women for these positions. But at the end of the day, it is the extent to which we are able to implement uh, the policies and the international instruments and what's envisioned in the Constitution that will make this possible. And you've seen the resistance that, that women have to occupy any position anywhere. It takes a very special kind of um, boss, especially if he's a man, if he has to choose between a male and female to choose the woman. Because women, when they do interviews, by and large, they excel. And so I've seen a lot of male mentors as well mm -hmm. coming up to work alongside women. And this is what we are doing now to help women rebuild, to help women retain their positions and grow in them and have very clear uh, progression paths through having mentors and coaches that would work alongside them to prepare them for the future. Uh, all right. And speaking of implementation, Caroline, let me bring you on this one. It has been said you have to be intentional in this season to ensure that these women we're seeing have so many balls to balance in the air are actually able to thrive. So is it something as APSA you have done to ensure that there is an equal playing field for both the male and the female gender in the workplace? Thanks for that question. And maybe before I answer that, I just want to pick up from where Jack left around, um, you know, what's deeply entrenched in our societies. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to add there's this um, issue of an unconscious bias deeply rooted in, in cultural practices that are, you know, centuries old. And so, you know, the, the, the thing that we have to be very conscious of is that you're dealing with things seen and unseen and to, un, you know, to dismantle what has been in place for so long by way of, uh, you know, perceptions, what a woman's role is, even a woman's role, uh, her own perception of herself, because sometimes even the women see themselves in a particular way because of their socialization and the cultural, um, you know, what have they been brought up culturally, is something that has to be done uh, fairly intentionally, it has to be grappled with, and we have to take a long-term view, uh, because in anything short of that will just be tokenism. Uh, within APSA, I would like to say that uh, we've done quite a bit of work. Um, internally, we have uh, the Women Network Forum, which essentially does exactly uh, what Jackie mentioned there, which is prepare uh, junior and middle management ladies for senior leadership positions. And I'm proud to say that uh, we do have quite a heavy skew in terms of the male-female gender split. It's 48% women, uh, 52 uh, men overall. We, uh, we were one of the first companies to achieve a 50-50 gender parity in the board, uh, board, um, board members um, mm -hmm. in 2014. That has since changed, but we are in the process of, uh, you know, uh, obviously it's a dynamic world, people, it's not static. So uh, there has been some shifts, but there's a real commitment within the organization to ensure that, that the women find their proper place. Uh, we also uh, last year launched what we call the She Can Manifesto, which is an internal program again to get people, uh, both male and female within the organization to support their female counterparts in getting uh, ahead and getting their rightful place at the table. Uh, and all these uh, you know, have mentorship, training, coaching, uh, addressing some of those mental things like I talked about, the unconscious bias, we have unconscious bias training, uh, and all these works together to enable the APSA workplace to be one that is actually uh, you know, celebrates and 
and is doing a good job of including women. But as we say, there's a long way to go because the statistics as you go up the, the, the hierarchy of the organization obviously uh, fall down. Yeah, um, That is internally. Externally, we are now in the process of rolling out our programs within the women in business and within all these other areas where we work with She Trades, the ITC, the World Trade Organization, to again do the same thing grapple with this issue at a foundational level, access to information, um, you know, mentoring, coaching, dealing with both the soft and the hard issues so that we can actually as a society move things forward. Okay, and still on the gender roles, let me bring in uh, Gal Gallo. I mean, you again are in a male-dominated uh, field and you come from a minority community. And these are two things that you've had to literally face head on to be able to be the successful engineer you are today. What do you think should be done more to ensure that these women have a chance to do what you do today? Yes, thank you, Gladys. Uh, where it's it's not an easy cause or uh, just an easy easy position to take because I know it's for me to be where I am it take years of pain and hard work mm -hmm. so uh, since I've made it uh, what we need to do is just to mentor young girls to encourage them to technology by giving them their the examples the real examples like if I made it I know if I relate to talk to young girls from my community, they can always relate with it because we share background and they can take it up. So it's just encouraging them and mentoring them, nurturing them to take up the cause. All right. And we'll talk more about the role of education in this success ladder that you are enjoying today, Gal Galo. But as we said on our call to action this morning is send us a message to any woman out there that you'd like to celebrate on this International Women's Day. That hashtag is new normal. And of course, you can reach us using those numbers at the bottom of your screen. And uh, I have Peter Mora who says women cornerstone of every family appreciated keep for the faith thank you peter we have boniface maramba who says happy international women's day to my mom agnes asante sana boniface uh, we have gaeb magnolia who says happy international women's day asante sana we have annie mudemba who says happy international women's day to my mom annie thank you and of course we'll keep taking a lot of your comments that are coming through on this international women's day we have isabella isabella is it isabella on the line and uh, what's your question or your comment Isabella, please reduce the volume on your television. What's your question or comment? Yes, what's your question or comment? Go ahead. Swalila konilipi. Tuna kusikia endelea. Eh. Nilikuwa ninataka kuish my mom. Mhm. Mm Happy mother day. Yes. Okay, we seem to be having some feedback with that connection, but Isabella, we hear you. You'd like to wish your mother a happy International Women's Day. And uh, back to that conversation on the right to health. And uh, Linda, this is another one that there is a lot of inequality in as far as access to the same is concerned with women and girls and, of course, children being the most vulnerable in this season. What have you seen and what can be done better? Um, as intimated earlier, Gladys, I mean, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw glaring inequalities when it came to the right to health and reproductive health care. Um, we had women living with HIV not being able to access their medicine on time. Um, there were uh, stockouts and they weren't able to get their medicine in good time. We had issues with access to maternal services and a myriad of other socioeconomic issues. Um, I'd like to take you back to the story we had some time back um, with the evictions that went down and um, a woman and her children who were taking shelter in an abandoned building were sexually assaulted. And these are some of the glaring inequalities and what they translate to in every single day 
uh, into the daily lives of many women and girls in Kenya. And we have to take a deliberate step to be able to bridge these gaps that have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we see an intersectionality of issues. Aside from their sexual and reproductive health and rights, we saw um, violations when it comes to women, land and property rights. I've talked about women living with HIV. Socioeconomic rights are very intersectional and we see them play out quite intentionally in every aspect of a woman's life. And these are some of the um, gaps that we were able to see with the advent of the pandemic and working with many other actors, trying to be able to bridge these gaps, either through advocacy, strategic litigation, um, to ensure that we are back on track when it comes to be able to reach our gains and ensure that women's rights broadly and holistically are being able to be advanced, are being promoted and are protected. Perhaps at this point you can let us know what DREAMS stands for and what your objective is. So the DREAMS Innovative Challenge um, uh, is a consortium that consists of very many um, organization, organizations across 10 sub-Saharan countries and um, it looks at intersectional issues uh, that relate to adolescent girls and young women in terms of being able to look at their right, uh, health rights broadly. So looking at their sexual and reproductive rights, um, their HIV status, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, women, land and property rights, to be able to address all these intersectional issues and ensure that we are reducing um, the HIV prevalence burdens when it comes to adolescent girls and young women. Um, in the last couple of two years, we've seen that this special cohort, that's adolescents, continue to prevail with high numbers or high incidences um, of, of um, HIV. So being able to look at it holistically and ensuring that this special cohort, adolescents, are being able to uh, take care of themselves, understand their health rights, being able to speak up and voice up um, on, in terms of incidences with sexual and gender-based violence, and then taking back this um, knowledge to their communities. Uh, for Kelin, we specifically work um, in the Greater Nyanza region, so we work in Kisumu and Homa Bay, where we work with cultural structures. So aside from the adolescent girls and young women, we work with the elders, we work with various other community structures, and also the county government to be able to look at this intersectionality of issues and to ensure that this special cohort um, um, is living a dignified life and has their right to health holistically uh, being respected and advanced. All right, and Beatrice, you have an eye in into the Northern Rangelands Trust. And uh, I'm just wondering, what are some of the inequalities that were glaring during this season? Um, thank you, Gladys. Um, in terms of the Northern landscape, we, we work in a, in a very... Uh, patriarchal society basically, and there are a series of other inequalities that um, the landscape experiences. If you think about um, Northern Kenya, infrastructure is one issue. There's basically one main highway to the, all the way to Marsabit. So the rest of the landscape might not be accessible in terms of um, road networks, um, electricity, water is an issue. And also in terms of um, health facilities that are, you know, uh, sparsely uh, distributed in the in the space. So in terms of how, what services the women are able to access and also uh, the culture is really limited. And uh, what we are working with at the moment is trying to use the, the community conservancies to work together and, and, and create uh, a space for women to fully access the services locally. Uh, at the moment, within the Northern Rangelands Trust and Bidworks, for example, we try to create economic opportunities that uh, women earn an income because for true empowerment to occur, you need um, economic opportunities, you need the, the knowledge, the trainings for women to be able to, you know, have the ability to, to make decisions about their lives and their children. And uh, from my own experience is the, the women who participate in economic activities have the abilities to support their families in terms of uh, nutrition and also being able to be recognized within community conservancies and also given leadership roles to be able to influence decisions that happen in the landscape. Thank you. 
All right. Now, earlier I mentioned that we needed to come back to the role of education in as far as uh, leveling that playing field for the women is concerned. And Jacqueline, I, this is something that FKE is very passionate about, especially pushing young girls towards taking those uh, STEM subjects. And uh, Galgalo is actually a testimony of the success that these girls can have. Talk more about this. We realized... Um when we started the Female Future Program for the women who are already working and are advancing in their careers, that we needed to do something for the younger girls mm -hmm. in terms of influencing the choices they make. Which subjects are they going to study? There's a natural hesitation uh, on the part of women uh, towards the STEM subjects. You just think you can't do it. You don't even know whether you can do it or you can't. So it's making it... Um, accessible to girls and helping them make a decision that yes I'm good in maths I'm, I can try sciences mm -hmm. making that attractive and we are doing that in partnership with our sister organization in Norway the Norwegian employers to have a program that works with young people to make it attractive for them to move into STEM subjects it's part of it is, is part of the curriculum anyway but making it possible for young girls to have mentors to see role models of women who have excelled in that field, they go to schools, they give talks, and we give awards uh, to those who do well, so that girls can shine in all fields of life, because there is a stereotyping of women, and I think now the space has opened up more uh, to young girls, but there's a natural hesitation on their part to make those choices. So the STEM program makes it possible for a young girl uh, to just figure out what she's good at as she does it because you have to try mm -hmm. the sciences you have to move into uh, engineering you you have to be open uh, to that possibility and that's really working on their confidence and appreciating uh, that which they do and we've seen girls excelling I mean uh, we have an engineer on the panel yes women do very well in these subjects mm -hmm. and they make great scientists so through the STEM program, we're then able to prepare women, young girls at a fairly young age, to move into these fields over time and eventually um, move into perhaps a discipline they wouldn't have thought of, mm -hmm. thought of earlier on. Because women just tend to choose the social sciences, which I love because I'm a lawyer by profession. Nothing wrong with social sciences if, if that is your gift. But I think a young person needs to be given a chance to test their skills in all areas so that by the time you're making a conscious decision as to which side you're going to, including working with your hands, it's, it's a decision that is founded on your actual skills and abilities. Uh -huh. And Galgalo, you're one of those mentors and definitely a hero amongst us for so many other girls, especially those that come from the northern part of this country. So what is this that you went to do in school for that girl that's listening to you today and they would like to be just like you? Yeah, um, I'm determined to cheer them up, to cheer the young girls to this technology space. And we are ready to encourage and continue encouraging and mentoring them uh, to be someone like me. To be, I want to multiply myself by just encouraging and advising them this is really possible and it can be done. And what subjects are these that you took in school? Yeah, uh, I took physics. And that is where my career of engineering started. Mm -hmm. I took physics and maths. All right. And how did you further that education? What did you take further on? Yeah. Uh, it, studying in a remote place, I, I first of all, after I chose my physics, I didn't pass well because I wasn't an A or a B material. But I managed to get a good grade that can took me to the course I want to take. And I chose, I start with a diploma in telecommunication and mm -hmm. advance it to the a bachelor of degree in technology. Aha, uh -huh. and how did you land on the Women in Technology Forum? Yeah, uh, f after, f after I finished my, my t telecommunication engineering, uh, I wanted to be part of these amazing guys, amazing company, Safaricom, mm -hmm. but I started with uh, working for their technology partner, a small company, mm -hmm. and from there I work hard and look forward to um, uh, applying job in Safaricom and first before I get to Safaricom I, I get this opportunity to be part of this uh, networking forum for Safaricom Women in Technology because we have a networking platform where we, they meet young girls and mentor them 
So through that networking forum, I, I, I get recognized with how I was doing well in the technology company, which is Safaricom partner. And from there, I get, uh, I get a secure job in Safaricom. Aha, uh -huh. all right. Now, it was important that you talk about your journey so that we can actually make it practical. What we're talking about here is actually feasible. Now, over to you, Caroline. There has been uh, talk criticism to the women folk that when it comes to the number of women in the workforce, perhaps it's fewer than the men because their qualifications are wanting. What is your experience and what is your advice? to the female folk? You first need to dismantle that. I mean, qualifications wanting, I think that is, um, that is, uh, is, is, a, is, is not a truth, shall we call it that. I'm trying to be uh, tempered in my language because I think for me, uh, we all know that girls actually do extremely well in school. Um, when given the opportunities, they can go on to become really, um, you know, do great things. And we know this, uh, and it's not just a Kenyan thing, it's a global thing. Um, you know, you're hardworking, they have all that it takes to be, um, to be just as good as, uh, and even in certain instances, better than their male counterparts. And it's, um, it's not a question of lacking, it's a question of, um, like I said, that, that filter, that lens that is put on us that says, not quite, you know, you're not quite good enough. You are, you know, you need to do a little bit more. You need to work twice as hard because you're a woman. So simply put, it is just that, um, that shall I call it bias? It's a bias and we just need to overcome it because it's not about our ability. We are competent and capable and just as good as um, anyone else out there. I mean, I, I grew up as a, you know, the firstborn and my, 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 I've got three boys after me. And my mother was very clear that I was going to be the, a shining example for them. And indeed, I have actually gone on to do exactly that, uh, working and, I mean, going through school, excelling, getting myself all the way up to where I have, I've got to right now. And so I think we should be less reticent we should be unapologetic. We should go out and get what's ours. And we should encourage our sisters right through, all the way from when you're really small to the, to the well, you're you know, right up here where we are, to, to, to demand more of ourselves and the society around us. All right. Now, before I take a quick break on your world, Jacqueline, we talked about the fact that the women seem to be in the middle, lower cadre. So with the right qualifications, how can, can we be able to up the numbers into the higher, medium, higher cadre? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yes, we can. And we must because women are just as capable if in some areas really much, much brighter, perform much better than men. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's our choices when you have a young family and you're th saying it's just too much. If I take on this senior role, then I'm, my kids are young, I've got to take them to school, pediatrician visits, and we make these choices mm -hmm. that limit us and keep us in this middle cadre perhaps longer than we should. In, in some cases, there are barriers that are put there that women are not given the chances. So I think what we should do is apply for every job and every opportunity that you see keep advancing yourself as a woman, take on um, training uh, programs, keep developing yourself and keep your eyes open. Mm -hmm. But every woman needs someone to walk alongside them. So if we can be mentors to each other and support each other. I have been, um, I have benefited a lot from people who believed in me and pushed me to apply for jobs I didn't even want to apply for. And I found myself in this position now because of that. People who just see your potential. Mm -hmm. And because women work so well and do so well, today we must make a conscious effort that women should get as equal chances as men in moving up the corporate ladder. There is a business case for having women on boards for having women at senior executive level, it impacts the quality of decisions that are made in companies, it impacts productivity, it impacts the bottom line. So you just can't have a board that's run by men. You need women's voices there because we think differently, we reason differently, we see things differently, we go by intuition. And that has, I have, because I serve on a number of boards, I've seen it make a difference when one decision was going one way, because a woman has voiced her opinion and given a different perspective, you then end up with more solid decisions. So it is not something being given to women in sympathy, but it is something they've earned by right, and we need them in these key positions for us to 
make economic advancement that is holistic. Uh -huh. And we're talking about letting women thrive, whether it's in the workplace, in business, wherever they are. So how do we ensure that we have many Jacquelines, many Galgalos, many Catherines, many Lindas, many Beatrices out there with all these balls that we have to juggle? Well, when we come back, these ladies will give us some of the tips. We'll be right back. Let's see what they're developing right now. Morphix pants with anatomic fit technology. New Morphix pants, an invention from babies for babies. You should also try Morphix. Introducing Pushindi Cream Basso. Pushindi Cream Basso with Oxy Bright removes stains effortlessly and brightens colors. Available in 1 kilogram and 800 gram bars and 175 gram tablets. Also available in all your favorite variants. Pushindi, a quality product from Pwani Oils. To achieve great things in life, you must do little things every day like the 1, 2, 3 with Colgate. with Colgate and give yourself a future to smell about. New Year comes with New Year deals. Renew your corporate subscription and get a bonus. Subscribe to Nation ePaper for 3 months and get 1 week absolutely free. 6 months and get 2 weeks absolutely free. 1 year and get 3 weeks absolutely free. To sign up, visit ePaper.NationMedia.com or email subscription at ke.NationMedia.com Offer valid till 28th February 2020. Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Kashanja. Happy International Women's Day. And to mark this day, I have phenomenal women in studio with me. Jacqueline Mugo, Executive Director, Federation of Kenya Employers. Ilado Galgalo, who is a Security Solutions Architect Engineer at Safaricom. Linda Kruger, who is the Lead Dreams Innovation Challenge Project at Kayleen. Beatrice Namunyak Lempaira, who is the Bidworks Production Manager at the Northern Rangeland Trust Trading. And of course, Caroline Dongo, who is the Marketing and Corporate Relations Director at APSA Bank Kenya. Thank you, ladies, for making this amazing, amazing day even better for all of us, even as we share how we can ensure that we uh, establish an equal playing field for the women in this country. And uh, speaking of which, six female artists from a London-based grassroots art collective, 
paint a large collaborative mural in honor of the International Women's Day. Now, the collective called WOM Collective was created to provide a safe space for women and to give them the confidence to take up street art, a field still largely dominated by men, according to its founder. The goal of the collective was to bring all together, you know, and also engage all the women that maybe are not that confident, you know, to paint uh, in the street, to just create a safe place for them also to join and, and create and give them exposure, you know, and also see each other as a sisterhood, as um, colleagues and not as a competition. It's for us, it's our therapy, and, you know, I think more than ever this time, you know, some people need to go to the park and sport for the mind. For us, we need to go out and paint. So, we've been out even, you know, few spots, like respecting, like, uh, distance, you know, and we were with the masks as well. So, it's not that I, we didn't paint for a year. Uh, but, like, it's good to join all together as well to paint because maybe you will meet in, like, one or two people just to paint. <laughs> It's a different vibe from, from the men because what we'll do, whereas a guy might say, that's shit, mate. <laughs> we'll be like, you can try it this way. <laughs> you, can, you know, there's different ways that you can you can move forward with this, you know. So it's just a different, it's a different attitude, you know. But also the guys seem to love what we're doing as well and they're very supportive. So it's just an interesting time for women to be out here and um, being fully creative. So we have, you know, we have younger women and we have older women. It's a, it's a whole collective of just female energy empowering each other. Hey. Come on, there we go. Let's see all, let's see all the smiles. Excellent. Yes, women are actually challenging those spaces that have been traditionally thought to be for the men. And uh, speaking of which, our conversation this morning is about how we can ensure that we build an inclusive uh, playing field for women in the world. But before we get to that, when Nadia told police about her husband's violence during a coronavirus lockdown in Tunisia, she nearly lost custody of her daughter, illustrating a chasm between agenda law and enforcement. Nadia, a victim of domestic violence, says her little girl told her daddy is doing things. She, show, she showed me specific places on her body and then she would leave. So I stayed to observe it and I called the 1899 hotline for victims of violence against women in Tunisia. I went to the police station and on the first day they took my testimony and they listened. They did their job according to the law. However, on the third day when I went there for a confrontation, everything had changed. Even the person who had taken my statement the first time did not have the same attitude. International Women's Day, who is that woman in your life that you would like to celebrate? Remember, you can send that message to that hashtag new normal. And of course, you can also call us using the numbers at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Kanyata Mathenge says, I celebrate Honorable Priscilla Nyokabi. Thank you. Grace Kibi Karaoke says, Happy International Women's Day. Asante sana, Grace. Another here, Wickley Fongoro, who says, Glado, my all-time best news uncle with an electrifying voice. She does an amazing international woman, and this day I wish you a happy International Women's Day, Wickley. I am very thankful. Granville says, happy Women's uh, International Day to my wife, Evelyn Mkabili. Thank you. Jocelyn says, hashtag new normal, happy International Women's Day to my mom. In heaven, my paternal and maternal aunties and all women in the world. Jocelyn, thank you for writing to us. Remember that hashtag again is new normal and you can also reach us using the numbers at the bottom of your screen. And perhaps to just reflect the last story we saw about uh, SGBV, sexual gender-based violence. This is another reality that actually glared during this pandemic. And uh, Beatrice, apart from SGBV, Ali Marriages, FGM also, you know, read their ugly heads. What's the situation in the northern region and what lessons have you learned from it? Uh, thank you, Beatrice, Gladys. Yes. Um, 
uh, what we've learned or what I've learned is that um, by women coming together and taking advantage of the systems that are available, then we can be able to address the challenges that we are facing. It's true that um, the COVID situation just exposed uh, the inequalities in the systems. It has also just exposed how much we need to continue supporting women and by doing that, we'll be able to have a more stable society. And um, women coming together is one strong system that needs to be uh, invested in. And by economically empowering them, then they can be able to challenge the systems that are undermining them. Thank you. All right. And when you talk about being economically empowered, challenging the systems that they are, and in this case, the retrogressive practices in our communities, what is the situation in the northern part of the country and what have women literally done to say no to some of these practices? What the women have done, so the situation is most of the women in the pastoral societies do not necessarily have economic opportunities because the, the system or uh, our lifestyle depends on livestock. The women participate in the management but do not necessarily have control over um, you know, money or sale of livestock. But by giving them alternatives like beadworks or other um, you know, capital investments for them to start other businesses, then you're giving them the ability to be able to say, I want to support my daughter to go through school. You're giving them the opportunity to save money and also support their sons to go through school. By them taking this chance, then that allows them or gives them the ability then to give their daughter a chance to be in school and rather, rather than getting married, for example. You're also giving them the ability to say, I'm not selling off my daughter because, or allowing my daughter to get married because I need to earn, or my family needs more cows. With the income I'm earning, then I'm able to, you know, support my family in, in other ways. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the things I have seen, and we, we, we should provide more and working with governments and other stakeholders to be able to, to, to give the women this chance to do that. Linda, when we talk about sexual gender-based violence, most women or even girls feel defeated because they feel justice is too far from them. They cannot access it for one reason or the other. How do you help them along with this? In the, um, going back to our dreams project, um, which I forgot to mention, highlights determined, resilient, empowered, AIDS-free, uh, mentored and safe. So key components that uh, contribute towards the holistic approach when it comes to addressing violations such as SGBV. We've seen cases surge in the last year and now a couple of months moving forward. How do we step in as actor, a multi-sectoral campaign of actors, both non-profits or within civil society and government. Um, one of the key ways that we've seen a very intentional multi-sectoral approach has been raising awareness, so contributing to the advocacy ground, advocacy aspects on the ground to be able to highlight the referral network or referral path that women and young girls should be able to take in instances where they've suffered violations. We've seen um, the Tunisian video and we've seen the challenges um, that that particular woman encountered. These are not foreign to our women and girls in the country. We have the same issues whenever you're trying to go to report a case. You go to a police station and you're asked to fuel a car. So being able to plug into these gaps, to be able to um, raise awareness both towards the survivors and towards the people, the key components within this referral pathway. Um, last year we saw a very good step where we came um, together, non-state actors and state actors, uh, to launch a, a, a one-stop GBV center uh, in Nairobi County. And we expect that this project will be rolled out in all the other counties. This is a good step to be able to ensure that we are um, addressing the gaps in the referral pathway and we are adapting a survivor-centered model. And this again cuts across uh, beyond women and girls and also looks at um, men and boys as survivors of violence. Uh, and today also emphasizing that as much as we're celebrate, celebrating women's rights and women's day, um, we also need to remember that women's rights are relevant to all of us as a community because women's rights are human's rights. 
are human rights. So being able to have a very holistic and also intersectional approach in being able to address some of these issues. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the gaps in reporting, uh, collection of medical evidence when it comes to SGBV, and how quickly are these cases processed. In March of last year, uh, the ex-Chief Justice complained and, and put out a press and said that we have too many incidences of SGBV amongst adolescents, amongst young people. And that tells us that we are forgetting an entire cohort and we need to be able to scale up the efforts um, in terms of advocacy, but also again addressing the gaps in the referral pathways. Very well said. And uh, over to you, Caroline. I mean, uh uh, domestic violence is something else that really surged during this season and uh, we all have women amongst us and different stories come to the table. How do we ensure that you look out for the wellness of these women because they might not talk about what's happening back at home because they want to keep this job but at the end of the day they are human beings. Mm. Yeah, um, and, and during this time actually uh, as, a, as, a, as a bank, as a corporate, we actually... Um, came up with something that would, was unexpected uh, and part, uh, partnered with our mental uh, and uh, uh, wellness um, provider to provide, um, to provide hotlines, a care line, because we realized that some of the problems that people were facing, uh, you know, they couldn't talk about them uh, to anybody and so therefore needed uh, professional help. So mm -hmm. we set up a care line um, where you could call in privately, uh, share whatever issues you were having, and that care line was available for both internal uh so colleagues internally as well as external uh, uh people who were uh, experiencing difficulties and we provided you know the framework for for somebody to be able to call in uh share their issue with a professional counselor and coming out of that get the necessary coaching and and help and uh, support that they needed so that was one way in which absa actually you know uh, demonstrated its humanness and uh, its connection with that we are not just you know human beings are holistic and we need to take care of them uh, in, in a holistic manner and as a brand that uh, cares that seeks to be um, an active force for good there has to be an engagement that goes beyond just financial provision and so that's something i'm particularly proud of uh, because we we stepped up as a corporate and did a bit uh, in terms of supporting uh, women and obviously the wider community with that uh, with that facility, and that goes on uh, even now internally. We still have the same uh, going on. Uh, uh, the, those care lines are available to colleagues uh, within the organisation, so that in the event that they are facing any issue, they can get the help they need and um, uh, essentially, you know. Get, get the help they need and, and move, move out of the precarious situations that they may be in and also just coach them out and um, enable them to, to function uh, going mm -hmm. forward. Okay. So, uh -huh. yeah, ABSA cares and, uh, and, and that's something that we, we, we were not just talking, we were walking the talk. Excellent. And Jack is still staying in the workplace. As I mentioned earlier, access to justice is one uh, thing that most women feel is too... It's beyond them. And especially when you talk about uh, violence within the workspl workplace, it has happened. Who do I go to? Is FKE putting in place or has it put in place uh, programs that ensure that women access justice? Yes, we have. We have over the last few years, especially when the new Constitution 2010 and the labor laws that we currently have came into force, we ensure that in those laws is a provision that stops violence and harassment at work. And most workplaces that have more than 20 staff are required to have a policy that addresses this issue, to have systems within the company or the enterprise that gives a woman a platform to raise a complaint and requires that company or enterprise to have a specific manager in charge of that so that women can come and report their cases and also to an extent be assured of anonymity. But of course these, these are documents, it's paper. How, how is it uh, lived out? That is where the challenge is because a woman will be scared. Now if I go and say that my boss is doing this to me, what will happen to my job? And if this news gets out, then usually it's the victim that is vilified and seen as having as being in the wrong and that's even in rape cases so our culture and our 
um, I think protection of, of those who do wrong is something that we need to address mm -hmm. as a country. And suddenly at work, if a report comes, and the unions complain about it, we have a way of handling it. This person will then be disciplined and uh, they'll be dealt with, depending on the culture of that organization, because mm -hmm. we only help companies come up with policies. We do training programs. We do counseling sessions. During the pandemic, of course, there were lots of cases like that, victimization, because women lost jobs, and perhaps you're losing your job because you haven't compromised in one way or another. We ran programs that helped people um, address these issues, prepared companies to, to know what constitutes harassment, mm -hmm. what constitu especially when it's, it's psychological. Mm -hmm. Some, it's not always physical. There are these demands on you that are incessant. From, from your superior. So how do you deal with that? That is harassment. So dealing with that. And then, unfortunately, in cases where it happens outside the home and you have to go to the justice system, and because, I mean, in that field, that's a very difficult uh, uh, process for a woman to go through. The courts are trying now, but in, in earlier times, really, these cases were hard in the open. How do you go and recount this story in the open? Very, very difficult. So we need to make it friendly for for the woman we make we need to make the systems friendly for the woman uh, to come forward and give give her evidence sometimes you go to the police station they don't take you seriously but at the workplace it is an offense that is punishable uh, by uh, there are many different sanctions I know people who've lost their jobs because of that but the woman herself has to be helped you have to do some psychosocial counseling it's a very difficult process to go through, and, and that is the kind of service that we offer. We do this behind the scenes mm -hmm. as the Federation, but really prevention is better than cure. So if a company comes out and states uh, specifically in their policies and in their conduct that this is um, an offense or a, a, a trait that is intolerable to this company, mm -hmm. if the tone at the top is right, because sometimes the, mm -hmm. the injury is done at the top, mm -hmm then how will that person sitting at the top be able to inculcate this culture in the organization? So it's, it's really a, a consistent training program that we have to go through. In recruitment processes, you have to do some tests, assessments to see this person you're bringing in as a boss. Are they balanced? Mm -hmm. What kind of decisions are they likely to make? What is their history? Where they're coming from? So that you make sure you get the, the right person at the top. And we do recruitment for companies so that that person will then be able to permeate this culture in the organization. Mm -hmm. But it's a learning process, to be honest, Gladys. There mm -hmm. are many challenges. Uh -huh. Okay, and speaking about challenges, let me take this back to Galgalo. You are passionate about uh, challenging the retrogressive cultures back at home. And some of them, especially F FGM, early marriages, uh, some of the obstacles where we are not seeing many girls being able to walk in the shoes you walk in today. So what are you doing to ensure that uh, we stamp on these cultures? Yeah, COVID, COVID has uh, bring a lot of this into place because uh, for the whole of last year when the girls are at school, uh, many, has, many has gone through FGM when they normally they are busy in school but since the school was closed down and girls are just at home they went through FGM mm -hmm. it's a it's a culture belief it's 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 hard but we are still fighting with so many other women out there some are even I remember where school I was a board member mm -hmm. some of the girls like three of them they get pregnant during this COVID while they are at, uh, the school is closed at home uh, in the in like a community of ours, it's 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 not acceptable. But uh, the school has given them time to you know mm -hmm. to go to go take care of themselves. But I'm sure after they will deliver, they will come back to school. So we will still I will always still reach out to the girls, encourage them and mentor them, regardless of the cultural drift, whether it's FGM, we'll still fight. It's I know it will take us long way. To, to, to end this and then encourage even young girls even if they something had happened because some of them they are pastoralist young girls when the school is closed they are busy taking care of their livestock with men where they are not secure because it's not in a village it's in the in the in the out there so we will continue reaching out to them and encouraging these young girls talking to them like they can do it better 
because mm. it's not the end of it because the dream has to come valid very well said and uh, back to that theme of the day women in leadership achieving an equal future in a covid 19 world uh, leadership is critical because at that position women are able to inculcate their visions into society now i'll start off with you beatrice from where you sit looking at the patriarchal society that surrounds you but seeing women that are standing up against such uh, culture and excelling Apart from the economic empowerment, what else is giving them life? Thank you, Gladys. Um, one thing that uh, we take advantage in the northern landscape is uh, the collective power of women mm -hmm. and also the social relationships that exist. Because um, what we do is the same women who participate in the economic activities become the support system for each other mm. to be able to, to, to talk about supporting their own daughters. So one, one lady motivates or mentors the other to be able to take a certain action, whether it's to take care of the grandchild so that the daughter goes to school. Or we also think about mentorship. We've, we spent the last two days bringing together women from our uh, community conservancies from the north all the way to the coastal region, where we have women who've been in this journey as uh, women in community conservation and emerging leaders to come together and talk about our journey. Those of us who've been born and raised in this landscape and are pursuing dreams in education and our careers to speak to the younger people and hoping to inspire them. So the whole uh, uh, relationships the whole network of women and mentorship and thinking about how to take this to the next level in our in our communities in our local community uh, schools we are thinking about how to bring gender conversations in our com uh, community conservancy structures is what we are trying to aspire to be able to give women a voice in our in our in our landscape because it's not easy as uh, galgala said uh, being in this society is very complicated and we have to, to take the opportunities come, that come to us, whether we are young girls, whether we are women, and we have to work with also ensuring that, um, you know, you challenge the norm and also uh, create a platform for younger girls to thrive and reach their potential. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, we are having this conversation and making it as practical as possible because these women are actually walking the talk. And I'll start off with you, Caroline. Who is your support system and how are you able to sit in a leadership position but still be able to balance out everything else? Uh, who is my support system? I'm very lucky to have a very strong um, family, a family, a family background and a family members that actually are my biggest uh, cheerleaders. So I'd start off with my dad and my brothers. They are basically um you know my 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 everything in terms of just um, giving me uh, life and, and and encouraging me and supporting me but i also have a very strong circle of sisters and when i say sisters i mean friends sisters that i have uh, uh, chosen for myself not those that i was born with and i think for me one of the things i'd like to point out is to say today a very powerful quote i came across the other day that says surround yourself with women that would mention your name in a room full of opportunities and, and and that I think is, is is one of the ways in which I have been able to really um, move ahead because I have women around me who actually mention my name in rooms full of in rooms uh, full of opportunities, and so that way um, you know uh, we're able to grow together. Uh, beyond that, of course, there's a wider framework. I mean, my organization is very friendly uh, and very supportive of women, uh, all the way starting from the from my boss uh, and right across the whole network. We have very strong, um, like I said, internal programs. I have been the beneficiary of those programs. And therefore, from that perspective, I've also been able to thrive. Um, and yeah, so essentially, I think I'm surrounded uh, with a great cloud of uh, you know support, and I'm very grateful for it. My job, therefore, is to be that uh, cloud for others, and that is why I feel very passionately about coming through you know programs like this and any other forums where I can also be a blessing in the way that I've, I've been blessed. And I think it's that continuous uh, virtuous cycle of 
of passing it on, paying it forward, uh, being somebody's cup bearer and mentioning her, her name when, when an opportunity shows up is something that we can all you know, really um, you know, get behind. And I personally believe in very strongly. Very well uh, said. Analysis. Very well said. Let's cross over to Linda. So you work across the country helping adolescent girls who grow into women and become their own person. Who takes care of you? I think for me, I have a really good support system in terms of feminists who have raised me, my mom, my grandmom, and my aunties. And this has trickled down within my professional life where I've had feminist sisters um, contribute to my growth professionally, um, guide me within the space, and even in my growth um, um, as a feminist who um, believes in the intersectionality of feminist issues and feminist principles. And I think um, just um, plugging into what everyone is, is saying, there is um, there's a benefit in us moving forward uh, together as a community of women. I know there are many myths and misconceptions that are out there in terms of women not being able to support each other. But I am testament that um, when women come together, when we contribute towards each other's um, growth professionally, personally, then we're all able to um, grow together and grow exponentially at that. So I'd like to celebrate all the women who've contributed to my journey personally, professionally, um, uh, within the space, and to celebrate them today and wish them a happy International Women's Day. Very well said. Now we'll hear from Jackie, Betty, and Galgalo as to who are these that walk with them and make them shine and be the leaders they are today. But before we take that short break, Alan from Webuya is on the line. Hello. Alan, what's your question or comment? Uh, hi, Gladys. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to uh, uh, appreciate you. Happy International Women's Day and all the lovely ladies um, uh, who are on the show today. Asante sana. And, bes and besides all of you, I want to congratulate, uh, first of all, my lovely wife, uh, who's I, who I call her my next of skin. <laughs> <laughs> Funny B, I love you with all my life. I want to appreciate all the mothers, the sisters, the aunties, the grandmothers, the female guardians, the women politicians, corporate leaders in Africa and the world. Women have always been powerful. Mm -hmm. Women are the drivers on the, and, and, and the movers and shakers, the silent movers and shakers of society. Um, they're the ones who wake up early in the morning, prepare the children, prepare life. Um, they, they, women have always been the silent movers and shakers of the world. And for that very reason, they need to be appreciated. But besides that appreciation, I also want to appeal to our men to start respecting women. Start valuing the woman who is around you, your wife, your spouse, your, ch your child who is the girl child. Let's Give them the respect they deserve. Men, stop harassing women. Stop beating women. You stop using women as punching bags. Stop, um, uh, stop, stop uh, push, pushing down women for, uh, for the accesses that they could be able to use and make uh, life better. We need to appreciate the women for who they are, the powerful, silent people who drive the engines, and nobody gives them their accolades. I think they should be an International Women's Day every week. <laughs> weeks of the year. But but women are great people. They mm -hmm. need to be empowered. They need to be given the strength. They need to be held their hands and be told, darling, you can do it. My daughter, you can do it. Women, let's get this thing going. But I want to appreciate all the women who stand up every day silently without uh, expecting an accolade. Mm -hmm. And they do their part to make sure that things happen. And may God richly, richly bless all the beautiful women out there who do a service to uh, making life better for all of us. Thank you so much, Thank Gladys. You're doing a great job. Happy uh, Women's Day to all the women in, in at Nation Media. And, and may God thoroughly bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alan, for calling in. And please, Pewa Moja Mbili Tatu on my tab. You're a great man. <laughs> on this, at this point, let's take a short break. When we come back, we hear more from this phenomenal women. What makes them great leaders and what can make you become one and still thrive? We'll be right back.
exciting opportunities for a lifetime of happiness. The future is bright because you can always bank on family. Family Bank with you for life. Make is the bright. Get 500 MP free kila siku and never miss a moment. Malaria ni ugonjwa hatari sana unaouua watu wengi hapa Kenya. Japo kuko na corona, hatari ya malaria bado iko. Mtoto huyu alikuwa na joto jingi, kutetemeka, kuumwa na viungo na uchovu. Alikimbizwa hospitali ya umma ambako sheria za COVID-19 huzingatiwa na ni salama kwa shughuli ya upimaji. Vipimo vilionyesha kuwa ana malaria na papo hapo daktari akampa dawa za malaria na kumshauri azimalize na ili kujikinga wawe wakilala ndani ya neti iliyotibiwa. Malaria husambazwa na mbu. Walio hatarini ni watoto wa chini ya miaka tano na akina mama wajawazito. Kupimwa na kutibiwa ni bure katika hospitali zote za umma. Usisahau adui malaria. Zero malaria huanza na mimi. Chukua jukumu leo. Komesha malaria. Ujumbe huu umelitoa kwenu na Wizara ya Afya. Mama Stevo, where are the kids? Mm, I think they're upstairs doing their revision. Oh, you guys are here. Maria and Steve, which revision papers are you doing today? Baba, mimi nashughulikia maswali ya marudio ya somo la Kiswahili kutoka kwa gazeti la Taifa leo. Na wewe? I am working on the mathematics revision paper from the Junior Sport magazine of the Daily Nation. Wow, this is wonderful. Are the revision papers from Taifa leo and Daily Nation working for you guys? Yes, Dad. Wanauliza maswali yao kwa njia nzuri na nyepesi sana. And the questions are in tandem with our syllabus. Dear parents, invest in Taifaleo and Junior Sport for KCP and KCSE revision papers. Kwa maswali ya gazeti la Taifaleo, usi ukose wa hundo huo kila juma tatu. Hadi juma mosi, in our Junior Sport, it's every Monday. Do not miss out. Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizob formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. Happy International Women's Day. My name is Gladys Gashanje and I have phenomenal women in studio with me. Even as we mark this day, talk about the challenges that have been in this pandemic and how we can come out of it as winners despite the inequality. And that goes to challenge those inequalities and ensure that there's a leveled playing field for all. But before we get back to that conversation, Dutch sex workers protested in front of the parliament in The Hague against being the only contact profession not to be allowed back to work as the Dutch government eases restrictions slightly across the country. We are the only ones that are not allowed back to work. Uh, and we're also here because a lot of us don't have access to any financial aid and this is going on for almost a year. So the situation is getting more dangerous and more depressing and really we're getting desperate. We need help. Yeah. There is so much we can actually do. Uh, we already were working with hygiene protocols, safety protocols, uh, before Corona even existed. Uh, we were using the hand sanitizers before it was cool. We are the original hygiene hipsters here. 
Now, protesters in Yangon, Sanchung, in Man Myanmar area used fire extinguishers to hide their retreat as security forces charged against the barricade they built, clearing it with a bulldozer and shots of tear gas. Now, 38 people have been killed so far as the military attempts to quell protests in several towns and cities following last month's military coup. <laughs> Now, UNICEF has installed 168 empty desks outside the UN headquarters in New York City. Each represents a million children whose schools have been entirely closed for almost a year due to COVID-19 lockdowns. Now, this pandemic classroom draws attention to the profound impact of keeping students out of school and calls on world leaders to reopen schools as soon as possible. For me, it is very disturbing just the sheer scale uh, and this representing 168 deaths, 168 million children. It's hard to get your, your kind of head around these kind of numbers, but when you see the sheer number of deaths, it gives you some sense of just how many children have been affected. The height of the disruption of the pandemic, we had 1.6 billion children with their schooling affected. That's over 92% of the global student body. These are numbers that would have been unthinkable prior to this, uh, to this pandemic. So the scale of this crisis was unprecedented, but also now the time that it has taken, a year long as represented by these desks, these empty desks, this is, uh, we're in new territory, once again just demands urgent action. We've learned from such prolonged school closures has a profound impact, particularly on vulnerable and marginalized children. So we're calling for all governments to open schools. Um, now, they should, schools should be the first to open during the reopening process, to take all actions to do so safely, but to also provide comprehensive support as children re-enter schools. From previous pandemics like the Ebola crisis in West Africa, prolonged school closures increased significantly. Um, for example, a, a significant increase in percentage of teenage pregnancies, in incidents of sexual-based violence. Elsewhere, residents in Texas welcome Governor Greg Abbott's decision to lift a state mask mandate and authorize businesses restricted because of a coronavirus pandemic to open 100%. But some are also cautious about the move. Governor Abbott said for nearly half a year, most businesses have been open either 75% or 50%. And during that time, too many Texans have been sidelined from employment opportunities. Too many small business owners have struggled to pay their bills and this must end. Abbott said he was lifting the restrictions because of the arrival of COVID-19 vaccines and better testing and treatments. So before we went to break, we were hearing from these phenomenal ladies in how they are able to keep a balance when it comes to their lives because we are cheering on more women in leadership positions. But as Jackie had mentioned, at times they shy away from those leadership positions because of these are the roles that they have to take up. So Jacqueline, you carry quite a number of hats and yet you've been able to do this phenomenally. How do you do it? Who stands with you? First, I'm a product of God's grace and mercy. He's gotten me from very difficult, through very difficult situations. And I was just thinking of your question, then who in terms of human beings has God brought into my life? And my mother is my greatest inspiration. Widowed before the age of 30 with seven children and primary school education. She rose up, took herself through further education and was able to look after all of us and educate us up to university and beyond. So on the coldest and darkest of days, when I'm tempted to give up, I think of her and I go on. Then I have a great family, my husband, my daughters, my sisters, who are always there for me. And beyond the immediate nucleus family, I have many friends, many women. 
and some men who are friends you can just talk to when you want some decision, you're going through a difficult process, fellow CEOs, fellow senior women, and even very ordinary people. I am blessed to have very many friends mm -hmm. um, who I can count on, and three specific couples that we are in a covenant relationship with to go on in this journey. Then my staff at the Federation. Uh, last year I saw them do things I didn't know were possible. We were learning and supporting corporates, advising them, creating policies. We didn't know these things, but we learned as we, as we went along. And it's just realizing how blessed one is even to have a job that you love, because I love what I do. Uh, it has its challenges, <laughs> uh, very many, very difficult. My leadership is largely male and men mm. lead differently. Yeah. I've had to learn very differently. I've had to learn through that, but really on the whole, I'm blessed to be where I am today and to have risen to the levels I have reached and to serve in all those positions I serve in. I never thought I would get there, but I just think about the people who've egged me on, encouraged me, pushed me mm. beyond my comfort zone. And my greatest uh, contribution would be to help a few other women to do the same. Mm -hmm. And clearly it takes a village. So let's hear, which is this village that starts, stands with Galgalo? Galgalo, who walks with you? Yeah, uh, first I thank God uh, for making my dreams valid and who supported me is first my parents. I'm so grateful to them. Mm -hmm. They give me an opportunity to go to school and choose the course I wanted to, to do always. Then later on, I joined this amazing company of my dream, Safaricom. Immediately I joined, they supported me to give back to my community by going, reaching out to the high school girls every year for the last five years. And I'm so grateful. So Safaricom Women Technology, as they say, their mission is advancing women, young girls from classroom to boardroom. Mm -hmm. And this is the reality. And I'm so grateful to the company and the young women who are so passionate about young girls like me. Thank you, Gal Galo. And for you, Beatrice, you stand in the gap for so many women in the northern region of this country. So who stands with you? Um, thank you, Gladys. Um, first, the person who gave me the opportunity is my father, who challenged the norm to allow me as a girl in our entire clan or family to go to school. Mm -hmm. So he gave me that opportunity, which has kind of always pushed me to be different. Um, I celebrate my mother, who stands with me every single day, calls me every day when I want to pursue further education, she, she's been there. I am inspired and supported by the Bidworks women and the women from our community conservancies. I am inspired by being with them every day, sitting under the acacia trees, being in the manyatas, and see them transform their lives. I am supported by my department, Bidworks, the team at NRT Trading, the team at NRTT, and a one particular priest was called Father Riwa who ensured I went to school and Kwaja community. Thank you. All right. So ladies, even in line with the day's theme, women in leadership achieving an equal future in a COVID-19 world, we cannot simply return to the world we had before. Our lives have will never be the same again. Hashtag that new normal we're talking about. So ladies, what needs to be done differently, which means, of course, shattering the barriers that hold women and girls back? I'll start off with you, Caroline. Me? Sorry. Yes, off. Caroline, let's start off with you. What needs to be done okay. because life can never be the same again moving forward? Right. Um, I think the first thing I would say is that we need to be intentional uh, as a society, as individuals, uh, communities, and everyone at large. We need to be intentional. Like I said, the issues that we are facing are deep rooted. Um, they are, you know, uh, long, you know, uh, centuries old, and therefore we can't expect that just by having a few conversations 
from now now and again that there will be um, you know that there will be real change. We must be intentional. We must be consistent. We must keep at it. I think you know people talk about this thing. Oh, you gender we women. There's been a lot of talk about women. What about the boy child, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm a mother of a boy, so I'm all for that as well. But I think when it comes to this space of uh, gender and, and women, we must continue and be conti- and, and and consistent in our communication and in our our uh, you know our our efforts to to make uh, make a real difference. We also need to partner with the he's. The he's for she, because truth be told, as uh, we've seen, the, the he's are still very much a part of the conversation, and they're the ones that are leading most organizations and most institutions. So, without their support and without enrolling them, uh, it would be difficult to uh, make any real change. So, whereas, yes, we can be our own advocates and we will be our own advocates and we'll do our best in that way, we must enroll the males in our world to also uh, stand with us. So that will be by education, uh, by continuous engagement, by calling out programs such as He for She, which I think did a good job a while back, but I seem I seem to think it has sort of petered off, because you know we have to have we have to work in tandem with our male counterparts, and then um, I think as women, you know, we ourselves also need to ensure that we. We bust those uh, the myths around that we can't uh, support each other. Mm-hmm. We need to make sure that uh, we we are our biggest fans. Be your biggest fan as an individual, but also be your fellow sister's biggest fan, so that we can really um, you know galvanize around this space. So it's I think both at a, a societal level, at a c- company levels, and and also at an individual level mm-hmm. that we must put in place programs such as the one we've been talking about and continue funding them and not tire until such time that we achieve an equal future. All right. And uh, for you, Linda, the right to health is one that has been continuously challenged in this season. And the women bear the brunt because they are the nurturers of society. What should be done different going forward? Um, I think with uh, the global theme, we need to continue to choose to challenge yes. um, a lot of the negative uh, gender stereotypes that we have because we have to look at the root causes of all the inequalities that we're seeing that trickle down into what we're experiencing, what we're documenting within the right to health. And uh, working with cohorts, special cohorts such as adolescents, both adolescent girls and young women, adolescent boys and young men, to be able to get rid of this um, gender stereotypes and to have a more gender transformative approach will contribute towards us as a Kenyan society being able to treat each other with um, respect, mutual respect and equality across all spectras including the right to health. As I intimated uh, when it comes to women's rights uh, and women's issues, we're not asking for special treatment but we are asking to be treated the same to all have the same and um, respected, dignified life as human beings. So being able to take on this approach in a gender transformative way trickles down into the other socioeconomic aspects, including the right to health and the right to reproductive health. Very well said. Before I hear from Beatrice, we have Christine on the line from Nairobi. She's still there? Christine? Okay, we seem to have lost Christine. So, Beatrice, what are you choosing to challenge this morning? Um, I choose to challenge to make sure that the voice of women is heard, especially in a society where the, our voices are silent. So, what I hope that um, we will be intentionally listening to the voices of women in conservation and in our communities. I hope that um, moving forward and post COVID, we'll be intentionally trying to seek and listen to the women and work with them in providing opportunities and give them mentorship to be able to rise up, speak up and thrive in our community conservancies. Very well said. Gal Galo, what do you choose to challenge this morning? Gal Galo, what do you choose to challenge this morning? I've lost connection. Okay, we seem to have lost that connection to Gal Galo. Let me hear from Jacqueline as we sort that out. 
I choose to challenge women settling for anything less than the best. Our future is in our hands. We must not accept the stereotypes, the barriers and the limitations that in many ways either culturally or in terms of corporate culture or national culture have imposed on us. As someone has said, we can do as, as best as anybody else and we must show the world that we can support one another and do better together. So as we talk about building back better, let's build back better as women by shining where we are. We already are shining, but there's a lot of work for us to do to open up spaces for more women to move up the corporate ladder to move up the fields of service politically, economically, and also to help our young women grow up knowing that there is no ceiling because that ceiling has been busted and it is up to us really to work at it and go for it. So be the best that you can and make a difference in the world. Very well said. Over to Gal Gallo. You can hear me now. What are you challenging this International Women's Day? Yeah, as the theme of the year, I choose to challenge. Mm -hmm. And how we used to, uh, how we can do that is uh, we can stick to the community you know, mm -hmm. and cheer cheer up the girls on taking up the STEM, the 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 field dominated courses, mm -hmm. so that they they can change the world. Thank you. All right, and we still have Christine from Nairobi on the line. Christine, what's your question or comment? Hi, Gladys. Good morning. Good morning, dear. I've been glued to this like never before. And just cheering on those ladies, especially Galgalo. Galgalo, congratulations, honey. You've just done a great job. Gladys, it's just nice to listen to you, Jackie, all those ladies. I have adopted you from today onwards. <laughs> my sister who got lost. Okay. Thank so you, Christine. I just want to say that really what the ladies have shared this morning mm -hmm. my tagline is never hurt another woman hold her hand because she is you and i can hear all these ladies saying exactly that we are done competing we are here now to support one another make sure that we all win because when you win and i win we all win and the society is changed so for Galgalo, I've been to North Hall where this girl comes from, Martha Beach. It is a battle she's fighting. And I really want to cheer you on, Girl G, as we really call you. And all the ladies on the panel, glad it, you're doing a great job. Asante Sana. Asante Sana Christine, a happy International Women's Day. And at that point, I think our conversation has come to an end. And let me just appreciate the women again who joined me on this amazing conversation. Jacqueline Mugo, Executive Director, Federation of Kenya Employers. Elado Galgalo, who is a Security Solutions Architect Engineer at Safaricom and also a champion of the women in technology in the same company. Linda Kruger, who is the lead at Dreams Innovation Challenge Project at Kellin. And Beatrice Namunyak Lempira, who is the Bidworks Production Manager at Northern Rangelands Trust Trading. And of course, Caroline Dongo, who is the Marketing and Corporate Relations Director at ABSA Bank Kenya. Ladies, I celebrate you. Thank you for standing in the gap. We stand on your shoulders and it's because of your sacrifices that things are way better today and they can only get better in the future. Well, that's it from us, from your world. But tomorrow we'll be back 7 a.m. this time round and uh, we'll be looking at a health matter, endometriosis. Now, this is within the Endometriosis Awareness Month and we'll be taking a slight turn of events and looking into something that most people would rather not talk about endometriosis in marriage now you know endometriosis is one of the biggest causes of infertility so how does that come to affect a marriage we'll talk more about that tomorrow see you then